Welcome to the Famous Graves Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Knox. This is episode 16, I do believe. I would like to jump right in and talk to you about epilepsy. Did not want to make this about epilepsy, but I see um, that I'm going to have to talk about this for the rest of my life. And the problem that I have is there's a lot of fake seizure videos on YouTube. There's also the uh, conservative site Babylon B has... Uh, making fun of children that have epilepsy. And I'm all about free speech, and I'm all about your rights. Uh, The problem that I do have is that these platforms like YouTube, uh, Instagram, TikTok, they make money off of this, and it's monetized. And so you have somebody, uh, there's hundreds of them on YouTube, uh, just as fake seizure videos, but it's pretty much somebody faking a seizure. And to me, that is, uh, first of all, uh, it's not helping, second of all, It is absolute misinformation. Uh, To me, it's harassment and bullying. And what you're doing is, and I don't know why it is so hard for people to comprehend this, but what you're doing is people see this, they think that seizures and epilepsy are a joke. Um, Then they repeat this, especially kids who have their phones at school see this, and then they uh, mimic falling down on the ground and having a seizure at school. My daughter has epilepsy, and it's pretty much bullying my child and other children. And I totally get why people, I meet more people that don't want to talk about epilepsy because of the fact that there is this huge stigma and I get no help from any of these foundations, these epilepsy foundations, um, can't do anything about that. And I reached out to YouTube. I reached out to the so-called, um, comedians that are making fun of seizures. You know, nobody wants to do anything about it. And that's, that's when change has to happen in this world of 2022, where we can't make fun of anything. That's what people choose to do. So that's why I'm speaking out and talking about this. And I, uh, I had contacted YouTube. I contacted, of course, Google owns YouTube and they're telling me that it's in their it's in their policy to do this. So I've, uh, over the years I've contacted different attorneys. I finally got a hold of an attorney, uh, basically the attorney, uh, you know, that I had to pay. Uh, I would have had to have paid the retainer of 3500 is basically telling me that I don't have a case because uh, of, def- of defamation. I don't have a case because it's not directed at me personally. But see, it does uh, feel like it's a personal attack on me, especially when I'm reaching out to those people and saying, uh, hey, could you take that video down? Because when people reach out to me and say, hey, which just happened to me once or twice, um, my TikTok, uh, which is Famous Graves, uh, if I have... Uh, and also YouTube, where I'm filming graves of famous people. I've had a few once or twice relatives reach out and say, hey, could you take this down? I I just don't feel like I want it to be on the internet. And I said, absolutely, I will take that down. And I think that's how it should be. If somebody is contacting you and asking you, especially asking you politely, hey, could you take this video down? I find it offensive. And that's what I find about fake seizure videos is offensive. I also find it offensive when other people are saying that uh, immediately we we can't... uh, Suddenly, uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna stick up for the people that have epilepsy um, or seizures, and so I want to be that person that sticks up for those people. And I think that the um, fight needs to um, uh, continue and go on because the foundations are certainly not doing anything about it. The foundations are great if you want to go on a walk or you want to go to a camp, but uh, I don't want to go on a walk and I don't want to go on a camp. And so I'm going to use this platform to talk about uh, epilepsy. Um, in the beginning from now on. And then if uh, YouTube decides to uh, take down those videos, I won't talk about it anymore. I think that's a pretty fair deal. But, uh, you know, one of the things when I was working on my... uh, I I wrote a... uh, I think I talked about this before, but I wrote a bill uh, uh, for the California because California has no laws. There are no laws in place for epilepsy, so that's why people with epilepsy can be discriminated against. Absolutely no policy, absolutely no laws in place, so thus people can get away with whatever they want, discriminate, and they certainly do. And so I wrote this, I wrote a law, and uh, I met with, you know, I wrote to every uh, politician in the state of California. I had one that met with me multiple times. It's a very slow process because they're always campaigning. And uh, she was very nice. But when it got to the point of actually, you know, having that law that I wrote and I took to her and I put it up there, um, uh, then she kind of gave up. And then I couldn't get any returns on emails. I couldn't get any returns on uh, phone calls, you know. Uh, in the beginning, I walked in there. I walked in and I, I brought the staff donuts 
think I brought up pastries a second time, but it was just so that they could, uh, a lot of this is communication. It's getting that information out there. It's a lot of, for people to understand, hey, we have a problem here. We have a huge problem and something needs to be done about it. And the fact that you've got epilepsy, which is your, uh, you know, it's, um, it kills more people than breast uh, cancer. And it just blows my mind that nobody seems to want to help anybody. And so with the uh, politician, uh, she lost the uh, race. It was the assembly race. And then she was trying to run for Congress and she lost. So now again, she's trying to run for Congress this time. And she reached out to me for money. And uh, that was a big thing. I, I've talked about this before, but, uh, you know, I think I donated $500. But there were people that were donating $500,000, multiple people that were standing in line. I went to a couple of functions, and that's all it is. It's just money it, Money talks. And, and unfortunately, I don't have – if I were to win the lottery, I would probably be able to cure epilepsy within a day. But I don't have that money, uh, and I don't think a lot of people do have that money. But so she reached out and wanted a donation, and then I simply just said, you know, hey, you – you know, I can't support you. And she said, why not? And I said, because you abandoned me. She wouldn't even, the, the fact that you wouldn't even call me back or email me back to, to just to apologize. Uh, you know what? I didn't even need an apology. Just call me back and, uh, Hey, what can we do? What else can I do to help you? No, nope, just totally radio silence. Uh, and, and I just, I told her, you know, it's just very sad. And then it was crickets. So I didn't hear anything back. Cause of course I'm not giving her any money. Uh, but that's uh, politics in a nutshell, uh, people. It's uh, who, who's ever getting these politicians are getting money hand over fist. So uh, that's my uh, my take on epilepsy for today. So get back into uh, the real world as it is. I was driving down uh, Tampa in the San Fernando Valley the other day, and all of a sudden these little like B- BMW the electric cars. You know they kind of look like little mice and. Uh, which I think like Apple could do like an Apple car that looked like an Apple. Well, anyways, these I would get one of these cars, but they just look so ridiculous. And so four of them just came out of kind of nowhere and boxed me in. And they had these yellow lights flashing and they were trying to like get me to pull over. And, you know, it's a yellow light. So I'm like, I'm not going to pull over for you people. So I slammed on my brakes. I pulled an old uh, Top Gun Maverick and uh, I let them fly on by. And then I kind of realized that it was like five blocks later where there had been an accident and they were basically to me, uh, overstepping the boundaries of, uh, what they could do. Uh, then I noticed that on the car, cause they were black and white cars was the LA County, uh, or not LA, LA city, uh, like police department. And I was like, well, that is weird because those are the dumbest police cars I've ever seen in my life. And then they had yellow lights on them. So those must be because they defunded a lot of the money for LAPD, right? You know, horrible idea, but they did it anyways. And then they decided they were going to get these social worker cars. So I'm figuring, okay, well, these must be the social worker cars. So I Googled it and I looked it up. And so the city of Los Angeles bought like hundreds of these cars and they never used them. And then they, so they bought them for like $40,000 a piece, which is another reason I wouldn't buy that car, but then they just didn't use them. So they started selling them for selling them off for 15,000. You know, I looked it up and there's a site where you can buy these cars, you know, less than 20,000 miles on them for $15,000. I mean, that, that convinces me to go in an electric car right there. But so I guess they created some sort of like, branch that I guess they're now because they got so much scrutiny uh, um, so I guess these little tiny mice cars are driving around trying to direct traffic or something I don't know what they were trying to do to me but uh, so I was kind of you know I'm like oh that's interesting you know get an electric car but then uh, so California you know I think I don't know if they passed a law or not but they they said they want to phase out all gas powered cars by 2035 which I don't I don't have an argument about that. Uh, to me, it's like, um, whatever, if that's what you want to do. I can't afford to have an electric car. I certainly can't afford to charge it out of my house. I see all these people that are charging cars over at the grocery store on Saturdays and Sundays. That's how they're spending their day, charging their cars. And what I didn't know about char- uh, about your car, somebody told, a friend of mine told me that they, when they went to Las Vegas, from Los Angeles to Las Vegas, they had to pull over and charge their car. So the full charge couldn't even make it to Las Vegas. You had to pull over and charge. So... Right away, I uh, the price of an electric car and the fact that it won't go very far, um, that's why it's off the table. But then I was like, oh, well, here's one of these cars for 15000 And uh, if they, you know, I don't care if you guys want to phase out gas cars by 2035, whatever. It doesn't matter. Because, again, it's just, to me, it's politics. Because somebody be- between 
2022 to 2035, somebody else is going to come along and undo that law, whatever it is, and we're all going to be able to drive. It just never ends. It's always back and forth. So uh, then we have this huge heat wave in L.A., which we have every year, and people seem to forget about it, and everybody's like, oh, my God, California's going to be underwater because the polar ice caps are melting in Burbank. You're going to be fishing in Burbank. And again, this was Al Gore's big thing where he won an Academy Award for saying that California is going to be underwater by 2020. Um, here we are two years later, and uh, uh, we're in a drought. And uh, so we're also got these cars and a drought, and it's hot out. You know, it's like 110 today. And my, I don't, you know, I don't think anybody's air conditioning works when it's that hot because I can never get my house, and my house is small. I can't get the thing to go get any cooler than 78. And I got to have my house at 70. So uh, I've been like Googling about HVAC repair and, and what I can do. And basically when it's just so hot, it's just the sun is beating down on your house and your house can't get any cooler than that. And uh, so I've still got to do some HVAC investigations, but it was very hot. And uh, so then the state said, hey, everybody with an electric car, don't charge your electric car because the grid can't take it. So we're going to phase out all these cars and then we're going to have a grid that already, you know, we've been hearing rolling blackouts uh, for the last 22 years because I remember in 2000 there was rolling blackouts and they were affecting everybody. I mean, the power would be out like all day long. And uh, I would like a Generac generator. Uh, that is, I don't, they are not a sponsor for me, but I like the idea of a generator. And basically one that would just switch on and off. So that would be my uh, my uh, of the day Generac, my not sponsor of the day Generac. So uh, I've been just, you know, trying to stay cool like everybody else. And then I was seeing also <laughs> that uh, they open up cooling stations for old people. And I just thought if you're this old, like if you go through your entire life and you say you're like 90 and your only choice is then to go to a cooling station in like Van Nuys, uh, but you can't get to the cooling station because it's just filled with trash and shanties uh, and graffiti and everything. I know you can walk through graffiti, but I'm just saying they were showing a picture in the news where the old people couldn't get inside the cooling stations because there's so much trash out in front. And thus, if you're not from Los Angeles, that's our city in a nutshell right there. It really sounds like everything is crumbling uh, around us, but I try to make the uh, the best of everything considering no attorney will take my uh, case. Uh, I haven't looked at it in a while, but they always talk about how that's the poorest state. Uh, so I guess they've had the water crisis going on, which uh, I guess their pipes were so old that it actually like burst. And uh, there's now there's 150,000 people without any water. And, uh, or they're, you know, they're uh, warned to uh, only use brown water to bathe in. So you don't, you know... It's something we all take for granted, but, you know, just imagine you wake up in the morning, you don't get to brush your teeth because you don't have any water, uh, you can't use your toilet because you don't have any water, you can't take a shower because you don't have any water, uh, and so for those 150,000 people, uh, that is horrible, and I hope they fix that busted, it's a, it was a treatment plant that, that broke down, but what I love is that it was, it was like one of the politicians had in front of their, it must have been the governor, uh, because be, uh, it was a mansion that they had. And there's always, you know, that's where politics pays. Whenever you're a mayor or a governor or something, they always give you a home. And uh, so there was a big water truck out in front of the uh, politician's home there giving them fresh water while everybody else was, you know, hey, just drink the brown water. I'm going to be, everybody's going to just be just fine. Ann Haish, uh died in a car accident. And however you want to look at this i just want to say it's very sad and i know that people look at it like oh that's somebody that was privileged and she was you know an actress but i don't think that she had worked in a very long time and i think a lot of it had to do they were saying that she was drinking they had pictures of her drinking and driving and um i just think for a lot of people especially when you've tasted success uh, at an early age and then as you're now uh, at an older age and uh i also remember she was um had some mental problems. I, I think it was maybe in Bakersfield, if I'm not forgotten, where she showed up at this woman's door and she was like speaking in another language. And so she's obvi she obviously had um, some sort of schizophrenia or uh, a, a mental health disorder. And a lot of time that, that couples with it is that you're not thinking rationally. Um, you're, you know, drinking. You're going to 
be drinking to, um, you know, try to alter those thoughts um, because mental health is a huge issue. And it's one that we don't, I don't know why, I don't know in other states, but I know in Los Angeles, we certainly do nothing to help anybody. We say that we do, but we don't help anybody that has all these mental problems. And I know it's a slippery slope because somebody like her, um, you know, you're somebody that's famous, so they're not going to put you into like, um, you know, unless you get arrested. The process right now is you get arrested. Maybe you have a 5150 hold. Maybe you're in there for a couple of days. The most you can be in any sort of facility is two or three weeks. I know they'll put you in like, um, like it's DMH, which I know you can be there for a couple of months, but that's usually for people who have committed crimes. And so usually that's then pushed over to insurance where you're going to go to some facility because it's whatever your insurance is going to pay for. And I don't know why they haven't figured out like the big racket with sober livings is that your insurance is covering you for being an addict, but they won't do that for mental health. And you know, the court system, they just kind of laugh at you also. And the court system is this old version of court where they don't, take into consideration your mental health. And so it seemed to me like she'd been slipping through those cracks for a very long time. And then what is it that you do? Because there's not much that you can do when an adult is out of control um, like that. Um, It is, you know, definitely, hey, don't drink and drive. Especially don't drink and drive when you're well past your, I mean, you know, at a certain age, you should probably have stopped drinking by then. But obviously these were demons that she was dealing with. Uh, there was kind of this conspiracy about how she could still be alive because she was sitting up. Let me just tell you, if you're in a car and you've rammed through this house, uh, yeah, you're going to sit up, but you're going to be completely out of it. You m- may not even be cognitive. You're talking, but you don't know exactly what you're doing. Um, and then you could easily just pass away. I mean, think about um, uh, Alan Thick. He's suffering a heart attack at the Pickwick ice skating rink, and he's He's sitting up, you know, talking to the paramedics, joking with them, but he's having a heart attack at the same time. Um, and he's 69 and passes away because um, he had all these kind of underlying heart problems that he didn't know about. And so kind of life can take us at any time. Um, and I just wanted to bring her up because um, she was, you know, she was a great actress. She was around for a very long time and it's just unfortunate. You know, she leaves behind a family and that's just very sad all around. And we kind of in this society get lost in that, like, we shouldn't feel sorry for somebody that's a celebrity. Absolutely, we should. Um, we should absolutely mourn her. Um, um, talking about her later on on TikTok. And again, my TikTok is um, Famous Graves, if you have not checked that out. I'm going to start to do uh, some lives on there, and I think that I'm going to... Uh, I do want to scratch off some lottery tickets. Uh, and definitely, uh, I'm a collector of junk, so I will definitely be giving some stuff away for free. Uh, coming up on the TikTok, li- TikTok, TikTok, Jesus, I sound like an old person, uh, on the uh, TikTok lives. In uh, other news, I found this interesting, is that an American nun who was kidnapped in West Africa by a group of armed men has been found alive. Um, Sister Celine, a Roman Catholic nun, was abducted from her bed at a mission site uh, in West Africa. Not many details about her recovery, which took place Monday morning as she was the 63-year-old nun was released into U.S. hands into the uh, capital of Africa. Um, the U.S. Embassy and State Department and various other agencies and organizations had been involved in working to find her. So this is what I find interesting, is that we always hear about this stuff. There's people... It's got to be in the thousands of people that are trying to work through some religious organization Um you know, you're 83, and I know you could s- kind of sit here and go, well, why are you over there at the age of 83? But again, what are you going to be doing at 83? Um, especially when you're a nun, you've given yourself uh, to the Catholic Church. and uh, But to me, that's just horrifying. You're trying to do good, and somebody comes in and kidnaps you, and obviously they want you for ransom, whatever it is. And there's, so there's thousands of people that are all over the world that are doing some sort of mission, missionary work for some sort of religious group. Uh, and it's, that is great intentions. But it's just interesting where, she, you know, people are getting kidnapped left and right, um, and we don't ever hear about it. And I think that's the sad part about the news, because the news is a lot of this, sensa- the media is a lot of this sensationalism. Uh, here's this nun just trying to be a good person, trying to do good, trying to help people. And the, or, the ordeal that she goes through, and you hear the it, it afterwards. You don't hear it, like, from the beginning of, hey, this lady, got this nun got kidnapped. Why don't we all pray for her? Why don't we rally around? You know, does anybody know anything? Uh, um, 
you know, the, maybe the embassy, the State Department did release something and the news didn't cover it. But those are the things that should be big news. That should be like, I know that we see like local news. It's like, you know, the guy that, that, uh, invent, you know, the guy created the giant, a giant ball of twine, um, these little stories, but that's what the news should be focusing on. Because to me, that is a huge story, a nun getting kidnapped in West Africa, uh, and, by the grace of God, she's still alive, which is absolute. That's the incredible part of the story is that she survived. Marked grave. And that is of Fred Gwynn. He, of course, played Herman Munster on The Munsters. Fred Hubbard Gwynn was born July 10th, 2000, uh, not 2000, 1926. Uh, he passed away July 2nd, 1993. Of course, American actor. But he was also an artist which I was not really aware of, and also an author. He did a lot of children's books, um, and I don't know why these weren't like plastered everywhere when I was growing up. Uh, and also when my kid was growing up, I had no idea I would have gotten them all. Uh, he's best known for his roles in the 1960s television shows Car 54, Where Are You, as uh, Francis Muldoon, and as Herman Munster in The Munsters, as well as his later roles in The Cotton Club, Pet Cemetery and My Cousin Vinny, which those three movies he's very good in. Um, he just plays such a great, uh, uh, to me, he plays like the great uh, creepy guy. Uh, he was born uh, in New York City, the son of Frederick Gwynn, a partner in the securities for firm, the uh, Gwynn Brothers, a full um, artist, and she was known for her Sonny Jim comic character, I was not aware of Sonny Jim. I definitely is something that I need to look up. But that's pretty awesome that your mom uh, is an uh, artist. She definitely passed that down to him because he did. He uh, went on to do several children's books. He um, his fraternal grandfather was Walker Gwynn. He was a priest born in Ireland in 1846, and he married uh, his wife Helen. His maternal grandfather was an immigrant from London who married an American named Josephina. Uh, he had at least uh, two brothers. Uh, Gwyn grew up in New York. He spent most of his childhood in South Carolina, Florida, and Colorado, moving around because of his father's work. He attended Groton High School, or Groton School. He States Navy as a radio man on a submarine chaser. So think about that. You're serving as a radio man in a submarine in the 1940s during World War II. Uh, just imagine the amount of boredom that you had. Uh, it was probably that 99% boredom with that 1% uh, pure terror. Because you're basically, you're in an underwater coffin as far as I'm concerned. My hat's off to anybody that's uh, serving uh, in a submarine. In the 1940s, uh, he was a summertime swim instructor at a yacht club in Massachusetts. He later studied art under the GI Bill before attending Harvard, where he was affiliated with the Adams House, graduating in 1951. He was a member of the Fly Club, sang with the a cappella group, the Harvard... Crocodillos was a cartoonist for the Harvard Lampoon, eventually becoming the president of the Harvard Lampoon, and acted for the Hasty Pudding uh, Theater. So Hasty Puddings is basically like, that's uh, a very prestigious, well-known uh, that's the acting, or the theater group at um, Harvard University. Uh, another place that I will never achieve uh, status of going to. So that's pretty amazing at the things that Gwyn accomplished in his young age. He uh, joined a theater group in 1951, moved to New York to support himself. He worked as a copywriter for uh, J. Walter Thomas, resigning in 1952. So one year after getting to New York, he gets his role in Broadway as a gangster in a comedy called Mrs. McThing, starring Helen Hayes. That's uh, a pretty amazing. Uh, it sounds to me like he was very focused and he he knew exactly what he wanted out of his life and that was to act in 1954 he made his first cinematic appearance playing an unaccredited role the character of slim in the oscar-winning film on the waterfront three what is that three years later he's in an, an academy award uh winning movie on the waterfront uh that's pretty amazing i gotta rewatch on the waterfront uh shortly afterwards phil Sir silver saw him and uh hired him uh, Gr Gwyn made a memorable appearance on the Phil Silva show in an episode called Eating the, uh, the Eating Contest. Uh, he was asked to come back again for the Phil Silver show. And uh, his, those appearances then led, of course, to him be, to be cast in Car 54, Where Are You? That's Patrolman Francis Muldoon. I think he played a great cop, uh, definitely a great patrolman. Uh, and, of course, he's six foot five, so he's just like a menacing uh, uh, cop. 
And that's what ultimately led to Herman Munster, the goofy parody of Frankenstein Monster in the Munsters. Um, he uh, had to wear 40 to 50 pounds of padding, makeup, and uh, four-inch uh, asphalt boots. His face was painted a bright violet because it captured the most light on the black and white film. Uh, Gwyn was known for his sense of humor and retained fond recollections of playing Herman, even stating, I might as well tell you the truth, I love Herman Munster. Much as I try not to, I can't stop liking the fellow. I, I think this shows his great character, because here is something that really at that time, um, it's black and white. I don't think it really transferred over into color when you're seeing the green monsters. Um, but just his presence, how he was, I, the whole cast was put together together great and i hate horror movies uh anything horror but it's basically this is your horror tv show with the vulnerabilities of the monster basically the monsters how are the monsters navigating in the real world uh and for him to he, he was obviously typecast as Herman monster and for him to then go on and say that's his favorite role um i mean i i just think that's great that for an actor usually the actors are spiteful that they got that role and complain that it ruined their entire life but here he is saying that he he loved playing Herman Munster and he played it so well uh his uh iconic role uh he found himself typecast unable to gain new roles uh for many years in 1969 he was cast in uh Arsenic and Old Lace he uh went on to do a uh Hallmark uh movie uh, in 1974, drawing upon his old Southern roots, he appeared in a role as Big, da as Big Daddy in the play uh, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. 1979, he played the stage manager in Our Town. So basically, after the Munsters went off, he was just trying to get as any kind of work that he could. Then he was in Pet Cemetery. I did see Pet Cemetery. I liked Pet Cemetery. Was uh, based on Stephen King's book, who uh, is only an inch taller than the actor and uses a similar thick main dialect. The character's likeness and accent, as played by Gwen, has been used in a number of episodes and animated of South Park. Uh, he he does. He plays such a great uh, that silent, menacing character. You know that doesn't really need to say anything to intimidate people. Uh, Gwyn had roles in uh, movies uh, on the waterfront, So Fine, Disorganized Crime, The Cotton Club. Love that. Uh, my, the Secret to My Success, Iron Weed, Fatal Attraction, and The Boy Who Could Fly. Despite his misgiving, yeah, I just watched The Boy Who Could Fly. Uh, he plays a good drunk in that one. Despite his misgivings about how he's been typecast, he agreed to reprise his role of Herman Munster in 1981, the reunion movie, The Munster's Revenge. Uh, he played uh, Judge Chamberlain in 1992 uh, in My Cousin Vinny, and that was his, uh, one of his last films. So he was also an accomplished painter and illustrator. Um, he also sang, and his uh, children's books, which I had no idea, and I wish that I had known this, uh, especially with my kid growing up, I totally would have bought them, but his children's books, uh, Daddy Has a Mole on His Nose, A Chocolate Mousse for Dinner. I think I remember A Chocolate Mousse for Dinner, though. I just didn't know it was his book. The King Who Reigned, Pond Larker, a, uh, The Body of Frogs and Mice, and A Little Pigeon Toad. Many of those efforts were based on children's books, misinterpretations of things that we hear as an adult when we were a kid. Uh, perhaps one of the reasons the books did, did not achieve wider popularity initially was the fact that their format was geared to a very young audience. So uh, to me, what I think is you go into a bookstore now and there's a thousand different books on every single subject in the world. I mean, you go in there and Kamala Harris has 25 books on just her alone. Uh, back in the day, there wasn't. When I was growing up, there was, uh, you know, where, uh, a light in the attic, where the sidewalk ends, a light in the attic, uh, the giving tree. Uh, you were very limited, the books that you... Uh, most of the books were adult books in um, when you went to a bookstore. And there were lots of bookstores, but it just wasn't catering to kids. And uh, Take a Nap Harry was another kid's book that I loved. Uh, and I think that one's out of print. But I just think he kind of, a lot of it is you can have all the talent in the world. Uh, he, was an Ill he illustrated them and he wrote them. And a lot of it's just timing. And uh, I think if, the, if he were alive today, that would be his bestsellers. Uh, in 1952, Gwen married socialite Foxy Renard, uh, a granddaughter of a, the New York mayor, William Gaynor. Before divorcing in 1980, the couple had five kids. He then, of course, uh, remarried again and then married until his death in 1993. He uh, had complications from pancreatic cancer. He passed away in his cigar room in uh, Maryland on July 2nd, uh, 1993, eight days short of his 67th birthday. To me, 67 nowadays, extremely young. I'm wondering, um, there is that correlation with smoking and pancreatic cancer. Uh, pancreatic cancer, 
of course, is one of my hugest fears of getting. I don't know why, but put that together with every other fear that I have of getting. Um, uh, just a fear of constantly, uh, you could call me the hypochondriac of, of all these things, and I would hate to have pancreatic cancer. A horrible way to go for such a great man. Uh, he's buried in an unmarked grave in uh, Maryland uh, at the Method, uh, Sandy Mount United Methodist Church. So I always get the question on uh, Famous Graves TikTok, uh, why somebody has an unmarked grave, especially somebody like Fred Gwynn, who is uh, was you know such a popular, strong um, actor. I think it comes down to three things. It's number one is money. A lot of these, you know, one one plot. Because it's the plot. You got to think about this. this is for forever, unless that you know. A lot of times these cemeteries get sold, they go bankrupt. So then, what do you do when you have a plot there that's already been paid for? And I know at I've I've seen at Santa Monica Cemetery Woodlawn where people have prepaid for their plots, and now they're trying to imminent domain them back because uh, they can't find those people anymore. So they post for like I think it's like ninety days. Uh, if you want to reclaim this, but you've already paid for it. So it is true that there is uh, uh, the only thing sure in life is death and taxes. I think that was John Adams. But uh, so number one is the cost. A lot of people, you know, they don't want to pay for these plots. Uh, Secondly, I think it's grieving. It's how do you grieve for somebody? You know, who knows? You don't. And then thirdly, it's just time. It's uh, something you're not thinking about if you most people haven't pre-planned their funeral so they're not thinking about well what is it that i uh i want on my tombstone i think a lot of the fans are like well hey it'd be great if you had car 54 uh and herman munster's face on there like you know like don knotts's uh plaque is a perfect headstone is a perfect example uh I, i just think a lot of people who just don't ever think about it it's like they want this huge monument and for most people I think for a lot of people who are, especially celebrities that are cremated, that's just not something that they're thinking about. Other, I would say number four would probably be religious reasons. Uh, some people just choose not to have a marker about themselves. Um, maybe there's something in the Bible about that. I have no idea. Anyways, like, subscribe, tell me what you want me to see. Please check out uh, Famous Graves on TikTok. I changed over to Famous Graves. Mike Knox Famous Graves on Instagram if you want to check that out.